We're pleased today to um, bring in a guest speaker, and his name is Corey Cicchetti, which rhymes with spaghetti, and we're glad that he is all the way, visiting us all the way from Denver. And he's Associate Professor of Business Ethics and Legal Studies in the Daniels College of Business at the University of Denver, and he's one of the university's most popular and highest rated professors. And he has a law degree from Duke University of Law, a master's degree in religious studies, and two bachelor's degrees in finance and economics, which he got summa cum laude from the University of Denver, an overachiever that would be Corey. In um, 2006, Corey won the Charles Hewitt Master Teacher Competition at the National Meeting of the Academy of Legal Studies in Business, and in 2007, he was awarded the Outstanding Professor of the Year Award by the University of Denver Alumni Association. Corey teaches classes in business ethics, business law, employment law, and constitutional law in, the depart in a department ranked by the Wall Street Journal as seventh in the world for producing students with high ethical standards. He speaks to thousands of individuals each year about authentic success and living an ethical life and is the author of the book, Real Rabbits, Chasing an Authentic Life. A Colorado native, Corey resides in Westminster, Colorado with his wife, Jillian. So please join me now in welcoming Corey Cicchetti. How's everybody doing? I like to look around my audience and see if y'all are good looking, somewhat <laughs> ugly. You never know what you're going to get on the road. Believe me, you have no idea what I see. But this is a pretty good looking group. Uh, here's why I mentioned that. I'm reading through the newspaper. So picture this. About four years ago, I wake up. It's early in the morning. In front of me is the newspaper. And here are the stories. America is doomed. That's what it said. The second story said, Medicare is bankrupt. Social Security is on its way to being bankrupt. Medicaid is bankrupt. Crisis and war and debt and deficits. And I'm thinking, man, I just woke up. I don't want to read this anymore. So I'll put this down. I'll read the next section right in front of me. It's the business page. And those stories will be better. I mean, I'm a business professor, right? Those stories will be better. What do you think? Were they better? <laughs> <laughs> they were worse. Bernie Madoff going to jail. You heard of Bernie Madoff. Martha Stewart on parole for her perjury conviction. There were lawyers going to jail and doctors going to jail and CEOs going to jail and accountants committing fraud. And I'm thinking, man, I just woke up. <laughs> I'm going to put this down. I'm going to open up the next section right in front of me, which is the sports page. And I'll read about sports. And that'll be better. What do you think? It was worse. Of course it was worse. There was a basketball referee in cahoots with the mob, shaving points off basketball games for the mob so the mob would make money. Michael Phelps was smoking pot. Remember that story? That was important enough for the newspaper. And then there were professional baseball players testifying in front of Congress about performance enhancing drugs and lying, just lying to Congress. And so I put that down. I had one more section left. The arts, it's where the crossword puzzle is. It's the only thing there that I think is good. And so I was going to do the crossword puzzle and then tell everyone I read the paper. So here was the article staring right at me. I couldn't put this down. It said, it has been officially found that one out of every three Americans is ugly. <laughs> I was thinking, well, how can I not read that? And it's better than war, right, if you have to choose. So here's what they did. They hired this mathematician from Cornell, a PhD in math, and came up with a complicated algorithm, input certain factors, and output whether or not someone's ugly. So I don't need a PhD in math. Here's how I would do it. I want everyone in this room to look at the person on your left. If the person on your left is good looking, go like this. Okay, some of you are like, which is awkward because they can see you. Okay, I want everyone in this room to look at the person on your right. If the person on your right is good looking, go like this. All right, listen very carefully. If the person on your left and the person on your right are both good looking, the ugly one is you. I don't need a PhD in math, it's just the odds. Let me give you a little bit about, about my background. You're probably wondering, so this guy is a lawyer and he teaches classes on law and he went to law school. What in the world is he doing here in a church talking to us about ethics? I mean, I think that's probably a fair question. If you are looking for an ethics speaker, you don't just run over to the law school and see who's available. It's like the last place you would go, right? So I'll tell you my story and think of your life through my story. So when I was your age, I sat in seats like this in college and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I hope everyone in this room is concerned about your future. 
right? Four years from now, ten years from now, where will you be? What, what will you be doing with your life? Will you, will you have a family? Will you, will you enjoy your life? Will you be happy? And I was wondering these things, and I liked history. I wanted to study history. I, I wanted to study political science. I thought that sounded interesting. But I had a voice in the back of my head, and I couldn't get rid of it. And it was sort of directing me. Tell me if you've ever had this voice. It said, Corey, you just need to be rich. Any of you have that voice? See if I could talk you out of it a little bit. So you can't be rich studying history. That doesn't work. And so I said, Corey, you need to go to law school because if you went to law school, you'd become rich. And I didn't even want to be a lawyer. So I graduate from law school and I'm $120,000 in debt. Think about that. That's how much money I owe back. And I don't even want to be a lawyer. And so I'm interviewing at different jobs and I ended up picking the highest paying job available. But it was weird because during the interview, the first meeting of the day, the, the lady looks at me and says, okay, we have interviews all day for you. We have lunch, we have dinner. Do you need to go to the bathroom? And I said, yeah, okay. She goes, it's down the hall and to the right. And I said, okay, I went down the hall and to the right. And out of nowhere comes this young attorney, this junior associate. He was looking for me apparently. And he saw me go into the bathroom and he followed me in there. Ever had someone follow you into a bathroom? <laughs> It's awkward. Now, women, you all are weird. I accidentally walked into a women's restroom. Don't ask. Long story. But women were in there talking and laughing, and there were like three women crying. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> I'm 38 years old. I have probably talked to three men in a bathroom my entire life, right? This is weird. So this guy follows me in, and he puts his arm around me. <laughs> Ever had someone put their arm around you in a bathroom at a job interview? It's awkward. It gets worse. He starts to whisper into my ear. And I'm thinking, please God, let this stop. I don't know what to, you know. And he whispers. And you know when someone whispers to you, you just whisper back. And so there was no reason to whisper. But he goes, your name's Corey, right? And I went like this. Yeah. I mean, I thought I would tell him the truth because he had more information than I did. He goes, you went to Duke Law School. That's you. I said, yeah. He goes, my name's Scott. I went there too. He goes, listen very carefully. I'm going to help you out. Listen to me. And he leans in and he goes, don't come here. This place is awful. He goes, these people are really mean. You will hate it here. You'll regret it. You'll never see your family. Don't come here. Took his arm off me and ran out the door. Like ran out the door. Now. To most of you in this room, you seem sane. To a sane person, that would be what we call a red flag, right? It would be like freshman orientation here. Someone walks up to you and says, don't come to Andrews University. It sucks. Like, you'd be like, I'm already here, <laughs> right? It would just, it wasn't right. Anyway, he left. And I said to myself, man, that guy Scott is crazy. <laughs> He's wrong. See, the place, this law firm was going to pay me a lot of money. And that's all I cared about. So six months into my job, it turns out he was right. Of course he was right. Think about that. It didn't help him at all to come tell me that. Of course he was telling the truth. Anyway, I slept in my office for a week. We were doing a big transaction. Nobody went home. And so I would wander the halls at 3 in the morning. And I would look into people's offices. And they were all there working. Now, these were my role models. These were the senior partners, the people I wanted to be like the most. Monday night, they're in there working at 3 in the morning. Wednesday night, 3 in the morning, they're in there working. Saturday night finally got to be Sunday of that same week. I sort of went in there and at 3 in the morning I look around and nobody had gone home. And I said to myself, man, that guy Scott was right. This is terrible. This job is terrible. I need to quit. Well, you can't just quit a job at 3 in the morning after you have put 8 years and hundreds of thousands of dollars into something, can you? So what do you do in situations like that? Well, you call someone who loves you. I called my wife. I said, honey, I hate this job. I need to quit. I don't like it. And I thought she would say, this is my wife of like, you know, we've been together for 17 years. I thought she would say, no problem, Corey. We've been through a lot. We'll get through this. Just go ahead and quit. We'll figure it out. It's my wife, okay. Instead, I call her on the phone, tell her I want to quit. And she says, well, Corey, I never intended to marry a quitter. And I was like, well, dang. <laughs> Uh, if I knew you were going to say that, I would have called my mom. You know, like, <laughs> my mom would have been a lot nicer to me about that. Anyway, then she says to me, Corey, what else do you know how to do? Do you have any other skills? And I'm like, holy cow. Uh, no. <laughs> she goes, well, you need to give it six more months. And I said, I don't want to. And she says, I feel like this is one of these situations where we need to compromise. And those of you in this room who are in a relationship or when you get married, understand that it's all about compromise. And if you can't compromise with your partner, it will never work. And she said, can we compromise? And I said, yeah. She said, when do you want to quit? And I said, tomorrow. <laughs> I'm a good negotiator. Tomorrow. She goes, I would like you to give it six more months. Then you will have been there for a full year. Can we compromise? And we talked and talked and fought and fought. And after an hour, we compromised. And I gave it six more months. 
All these guys in here are like, dude, what? I don't understand. Do you see how these women just laugh? Other than those women on their phones over there, everyone else, do you see them all laughing? Right? They're just laughing at you. Anyway, I waited six more months and I quit. Then the University of Denver called me and said, uh, Corey, someone died in the ethics department. And I said, oh my gosh, someone died? A student died? That's terrible. They said, no, no, no. A faculty member has died. And we have a job opening. And I said, what? When did he die? They said, he died last week. They said, do you want to apply for his job? And I thought, he died last week? No, I don't want to. That's weird. Karma or something. And they said to me on the phone, I'm not kidding. They said, Corey, think about it like this. Bad for him, good for you. <laughs> and I said, what kind of ethics department is this? <laughs> you know? I don't know a lot about ethics, but that doesn't sound right. But what are you going to do in that place? You're jobless, you're 27, you apply, you died, okay. Anyway, at the interview they said to me, Corey, what do you know about ethics? Because I was going to teach law and business and ethics, all three. They said, what do you know about ethics? And I said, probably a bad answer. I don't know anything about ethics, y'all. I went to law school, that's what I said. I said, it didn't come up. They said, didn't you take an ethics class in law school? And we did, I guess. We thought back to it. It was kind of like this. It was required. We all sat there. The law professor walks in with this big book and slams it on the table and says, this is legal ethics 101, the most important class you'll ever take in law school. He says, it's a bunch of rules, so I need you to read this book. And we're like, yeah, right, 1,000 pages? No. We're going to re read this book, memorize these rules, think about them, and you will become an ethical attorney. As if it was that easy, right? Read a book and you'll become good. He said, I'm going to give you the most important ones right now. He said, take notes. And this is law school. It's a bunch of nerds, right? So we're all just sitting there ready. Uh, bated breath. Rule number one, he says. This is very important. He says, don't have sex with your clients. And I just sat there like, I'm not writing that down. Like, are, are you kidding me? I'm going to do that? It's ridiculous. And all my classmates are writing it down. I'm thinking... He said, rule number two, it is unethical to steal money from your client's bank account. <laughs> I'm like, duh. And all my classmates are writing it. I'm thinking, this is Duke Law School, the top five law school in the world, and you're writing this down? Like, you're future United States senators. So, like, on the test, you're going to refer back to your notes, uh, I can't steal that money from my client, B. <laughs> you know, like, really? Three, if your client is guilty, you can still represent him. You just can't call him to the witness stand and start asking him questions because, you know, you know he's guilty. But this is America and everyone deserves an attorney. And I'm thinking, can you email me this list? This is dumb. We went through rule after rule. There wasn't one rule I looked at and said, I don't want to be a lawyer anymore. This is going to be really hard for me. None. My wife went to medical school. In medical school, they took a medical ethics class where they all sat in a room and a doctor walks in and slams a book on a table and says, this is medical ethics, the most important class you'll take in medical school. It's rules. Read them and you will become an ethical physician. As if it was that easy, right? Anyone want to guess what rule number one is in medical ethics? Don't have sex with your patients. <laughs> and so she wrote it down. I got kind of mad. She wrote it down. I, I, call, I read her notes. I'm like, honey, are you good with rule number one? And she says, yes. And I said, thank God. Thank God you took that medical ethics class where they can teach you that sleeping with your patients is wrong. Rule number two, tell me if you agree with this. It is unethical to commit Medicare and Medicaid fraud. <laughs> Go like this. It's also illegal. So good. Number three, you might not have thought of this. It is unethical to cut off the wrong leg during surgery. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so glad she took that class. Listen, I think we make a huge mistake in life when we think of ethics as rules on paper, right? For instance, every university I've ever spoken at, probably 200 of them, every one of them has an honor code or a value statement. You have a value statement here. I, I saw it, right? Did you know that 70% of undergraduates, 70% of undergraduates will cheat between freshman and senior year? <laughs> every single one of them has an honor code above them. Corporations call these core values. They call them mission statements, right? Enron had a mission statement. Remember Enron? You've heard of Enron, right? They bankrupted all these people's retirements and hopes and dreams. Guess what their mission statement said? We here at Enron promise to be a company of the highest integrity. Whoops, what happened, right? Here's the thing. I think words on paper like that, value statements, honor codes, whatever, I think they're meaningless. Until everyone in this room has decided that it's important to you to become a good person. Until you've made that calculus in your mind, it matters to me to be good. Until you've made that decision, those are just words. 
My students know exactly what it means to cheat. They know exactly what it means to plagiarize. They do it anyway because why? They just don't care. The honor code is irrelevant. Yeah, they signed it. Yeah, they put their name to it. Yeah, in real life that's perjury and you go to jail. It doesn't matter. Something outweighs it, right? Listen, it's a bad economy. You probably agree with that. If you don't get good grades, your parents might be mad at you. Everybody else is getting an A. Everybody else is cheating. I understand how they justify it, but that always outweighs the honor code. At Enron, those people went to Harvard. Those were Harvard MBAs. They knew exactly what the word integrity meant in their core values, right? They just didn't care. It didn't matter to them. So I think those words are meaningless until you care. But once you care, those words take on great value. Isn't the same thing true about the Bible? I mean, it's the exact same. Listen, the Bible is meaningless unless you care. If you don't care, it's just words. An honor code is the same thing. So I make no assumptions, however, that anybody cares about being good anymore. I used to. Then I read a newspaper or I see the number of students who cheat or I walk around. Not a lot of people care. If I have a room of a thousand people, here's what I used to do. I used to say, raise your hand. There's a thousand people in here. If you believe yourself to be a person of high moral character, and that's all I would say. Okay. To that question, out of a thousand, how many hands would go up do you think? Everywhere. Yeah, a thousand. I mean, wouldn't you raise your hand today? You would. Of course you would. Everyone would. You don't want to be like, well, uh, not me, everyone else is. <laughs> so everyone did. And I said, okay, I'm going to call on somebody. There's a thousand people in here. Keep your hand up if and only if you can define for me what it means to be a person of high moral character. If you don't know, put your hand down. And how many hands would go down? Every single hand. Every place I ever went. But would the same be true of you? If I asked you to identify yourself as a high character person of integrity, would you raise your hand yet live your life in such a way that you look like a hypocrite and a fool? Your Thursday night, your Friday night, right? Honestly, what you do with your free time, the way you treat people, right? The way you treat your parents, honestly, would you raise your hand and live your life in such a way that that doesn't make sense? And so let me tell you how I teach ethics because ethics the other way doesn't work. Here's how I teach it. It's one story, okay, told to me by a man named John Bogle. He's famous. He founded the mutual fund industry. Mutual funds, Vanguard mutual funds. Think about this guy. Big shot. Comes to Denver to talk. He's in front of a room. It's packed. He gets up on stage and he says, tonight I'm going to tell you a story about a dog. <laughs> and we're looking at each other like, dog? <laughs> Wait, what is this? Well, I'm in the mutual fund room, right? He's, anyway, you're going to stand there. The guy's 75 years old. He's a billionaire. You're going to sit there and listen to a story about a dog dog. And so he goes, this is Cash the Greyhound. And he put the slide up of this dog. He says, think of the dog track. Everybody's there. These dogs race around. They chase those rabbits around. And everybody bets and people make money. He said, this is the most famous dog of all time. The night before the biggest race of his life, the owner and the dog are on the porch and they're talking. And she looks at him and says, Cash, everybody's here. Right? They're here to watch you, the media, the fans. If you win this race, you'll win $10 million. Are you ready? He looks at her and says, um, I'm not going to race in that race tomorrow. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to retire. I'm not going to, I'm done. And she says, wait, wait, what? The race is tomorrow. Are you kidding? Everybody's here. Are you hurt? Looks at her and says, I'm not hurt. I feel great. She says, are you mad at me? Is that why? Looks at her and says, you, no, you treat me wonderfully. I love you. Can't be that. Are you too old? Looks at her and says, I still have some race left in these old legs. I, I could still do it. I don't want to. She said, why? I can't understand why you would give all that up. And he looks at her and he says, all my life, all I've ever done is run and run and run around this little dirt oval track. And it finally occurred to me that those little white rabbits y'all have me chasing aren't real. And a room full of really smart people that night went, what? Some of you just did that. Wait, what? Has this ever happened to you? Someone says something that's profound and you don't get it for like 45 minutes. That, that was me that night. I didn't care. I'm like, whatever, that's cute. So if that's you right now, give yourself 45 minutes. I'll be long gone. You'll be like, oh yeah, the dog. You'll be behind. Anyway, he walks off stage and I could swear he was looking right at me and he says, and he wasn't, but I thought he was. He looks and he says, you can never get enough of what you don't need to make you happy. Right? And then everybody left the room and I sat there with my head in my hands asking myself the following questions. Corey, you have a better job than any of your friends. You have more money than any of your friends. You have a nicer car than any of your friends. You have more expensive clothes. Your house is bigger. You have a better education than any of your friends. And why aren't you happy? See, y'all, MTV had lied to me. <laughs> 
MTV had told me that if I had these things, I would be happy. And then I had these things. I had dedicated my life to having those things. And I was miserable. Why? Because those things do not have the capacity to make a human being happy. They can't, right? They don't have it. Think about it. Money. There's nothing wrong with money. I hope everyone in this room makes enough money that you can retire and send your kids to college and travel. Money's not evil. You could argue that Bill Gates and Warren Buffett will cure AIDS because of money. Money's wonderful. Money becomes bad, however, when it defines you. <laughs> what about looks? I have no problem with looks. I hope you are as pretty or as handsome as you can be. Studies show that the, the more attractive you are, the easier it is for you to get a job and keep a job. And attractive people actually make more money. Is it wrong? For sure. Is it human nature? Yeah. Here's the thing. If your looks define you, <laughs> you'll never be happy. You can't be. Those things don't have the capacity to make you happy. Let me prove to you that I'm right like a good lawyer. I'll do this beyond a reasonable doubt. Are you ready? I want everyone in this room to just close your eyes. Girls on your phones, you're going to have to put them down. Yeah, seriously, just do me a favor. Close your eyes. It's, I don't think it's funny. Okay, close your eyes. I'm going to ask you three questions. Question number one. Nod your head if you agree with me. Question number one. I know a lot of really rich people who aren't all that happy. Do you? <laughs> A lot of heads are nodding. But they're so rich, they should be happy. Would you agree with me that the prettiest woman or the most handsome man in any room is often the least content inside? But she's so pretty. She's so skinny. He's so handsome and athletic. Think back to high school. The most popular person in your high school, if you really got to know that person, probably had the least self-confidence of anybody. They were faking it, right? But they were so popular. I guess what I would say to you is I find nothing wrong with money. I find nothing wrong with looks. But those things are fake rabbits and they will never make you happy. And so what, what will? What can? What can make a person happy? Well, I've narrowed life down to three things. I've been doing this for 10 years and there are three things that make a person happy. And the beauty of this message is it doesn't change. If I'm here with Christians or if I'm at the Federal Reserve Bank or if I'm with eighth graders, which is awful. I hate that. It's terrible. Anyway, eighth graders, I say the exact same three things. Number one. Everybody wants peace and contentment in their hearts. Have you noticed that? We crave peace. We crave contentment. Why do people seek religiously? Because they're missing the peace, right, that God can provide. Really, it's the only thing that can fill that hole. But here's the thing. We live in America, don't we? A land of instant message. The instant latte. I'm upset because the internet's slow. The traffic line is long. Do you think people in rural Peru would care if they got to live your life if the internet was slow? <laughs> you think that would matter to them at all? Right? The people all around the Middle East, man, who are living in shanty towns in Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, you think they'd care if the line at the toll booth is a little slow? Right? It's hard to find peace in America because we're always going. We went to Paris, my wife and I went to Paris and we went to all the art museums there and we went to one called the Orsay Museum and if you go to Paris you have to see this, it's where all the Monets are hanging, okay, it's beautiful works of art. When we were there, there was a traveling art exhibit, it wasn't a Monet, it was just on loan and it was huge, bigger than this whole screen and it was in the corner and I, to me, I thought it was hideous. Now I'm not an art person, right, it, it doesn't take much to impress me and I thought this was terrible and so I'm laughing at it. I'm pointing at it going, oh, this is terrible and my wife is kicking me like, don't, oh, this is Paris, this is art and everybody was looking at it like, hmm, that's beautiful, hmm, and I'm like, I think it sucks. Anyway, the guide sees me <laughs> laughing at this painting and he starts to walk over and She's just kicking me like, seriously, how's your French? What if we get arrested? And I'm like, my French is terrible. Anyway, he comes up and he goes, I see that you're laughing at our painting. And I thought, oh, no. And I decided to be a good ethics professor. And I said, I think it sucks. And I'm just getting, you know, kicked under the table. And he looks at me and he goes, it's funny you say that. That's the artist's intention. That's every color imaginable painted onto canvas. He said he's trying to give people a headache by looking at it to depict an overly busy life. And I was like, I was right, you know, anyway, but whatever. <laughs> and he walked away and I said to myself, man, that resembles my life sometimes. How about yours? If I was invisible and I followed you around for two weeks and you didn't know I was there, would I be able to tell what you stood for? Who you love, what you're passionate about, seriously, your relationship with God. Would I be able to tell these things just following you around by the things you say, the people you associate with, the things you do when nobody's looking? Seriously, would I be able to tell? 
The problem in America is we paint our paintings so full that we lose the meaning of life. And then we become stressed. And when we're stressed, we cannot become happy. See, I believe this. I know this to be true. It is impossible to be happy without being an ethical person. You don't see a lot of unethical people who are really happy. And if the point of life is to be happy, then to me it's irrational to be unethical. But it's easier to be unethical when we paint our paintings so thick, so much. The second thing everybody wants, so that's number one, contentment. The second thing are strong friendships. We crave relationships. Humans are relational creatures. We want good friends. But college students, especially you, you look at me at this moment and you say, look at me, professor, I have a ton of friends. Look at me, I'm surrounded. I get this everywhere I go on colleges. And let's be fair, you are surrounded. Look around, let's be fair, you are. However, let me ask you a really hard question. Are you surrounded and friendless? <laughs> Think about this for a second. A friend is someone who would rush into your life when everybody else rushes out. How many of those do you have? And you can take a million different celebrities, Tiger Woods, Lindsay Lohan, Charlie Sheen, Paris Hilton, go down that list. Those people have everything, looks, money, fame. They aren't happy. Why? They're missing peace and they're missing friends. What Tiger Woods needed more than anything was a friend, right? Someone to look him in the eye and say, Tiger, you have a wonderful little family. You have two wonderful little kids. I have an 11-month-old, right? And she's so cute, by the way. She's so cute. Anyway, so to look at him and say, you have this wonderful family and this is your plan? You're going to cheat on her this many times? See, a real friend would have punched Tiger Woods in the face. Which I would hope my friends would do to me if I was doing something like that. Punch me right in the face. Tiger Woods didn't have a friend. Tiger Woods had people who said, I want to be around Tiger Woods because he's Tiger Woods. By the way, does unethical behavior cost you? Tiger Woods went from being potentially the best golfer in the history of the sport to now he can't even make the cut. Nothing changed but his moral compass, right? Unethical behavior will always cost you. So how good of friends do you have? Here's the beauty of this message. You only need three. <laughs> if you could graduate from college with three friends, you're a winner. I know very few people with three friends. Isn't that refreshing? You don't need 20. You just need three. The third thing everybody wants, and I know this to be true, is character. We all desperately want to be good. Deep down, every person wants to be good. We just get really good at putting our conscience on mute. <laughs> You done this lately? I know I shouldn't lie. I know I shouldn't gossip. I know I shouldn't do this, but mute, I want to. I want everyone in this room to think back to the first lie you ever told. <laughs> if you can even remember. M mine was to my grandparents. I didn't want to lie, but I broke something of theirs. But I had never really lied before. I might have been five or six and I was a terrible liar, right? And I didn't want to tell the truth. But thinking about lying to them was agonizing for me. And then when I was actually telling them the lie, it was agonizing for me. And then the aftermath of the lie was, was not so fun for me. And, but let me, that was a really hard lie for me to tell. But let me tell you all something. <laughs> Man, it's easier now. What about for you? I got to be honest. It is easy sometimes for me to lie now. What about you? Those of you in this room who gossip, I bet the first time you talked bad about someone else, it didn't feel right. Isn't it easier now? Those of you in this room who are jerks to people, you're mean to other people, I bet that was hard at first and now it comes second nature, doesn't it? The first time you cheated in school, it didn't feel right and now you just do it like it's nothing. When I first started teaching, the thing that disappointed me the most is how an 18-year-old could walk up to me, look me right in the eyes and lie. I never, I never would have lied to my professors and now it's just easy. The thing is, here's character to me. It's how you act when nobody's looking. And it's how you treat people who can't do anything for you. I mean, everybody's pretty nice to me. Debbie, are people nice to you? I'm sure. Right? I mean, people are really nice to me. I'm the speaker. I care more about the next time you're served food and someone walks over and refills your water glass. Do you look them in the eye and say thank you? When they bust your plates away, take them away for you. Do, they, do you look them in the eye and say thank you? Or is that not even a person to you? Are we so engrossed in our conversations and our phones? Are we so engrossed in this that we miss this? There's an awesome movie called Any Given Sunday with Al Pacino. You need to watch this movie. And he's in the locker room giving this speech. And he says, life is the six inches in front of your face. Not six inches with your phone in front of your face. In front of your eyes. Are you missing the six inches in front of your face? 
Honestly. Is your character dependent upon your phone? I would say to you, put it down and plug into life. So how do you do these things? How can you start being good? I'm going to give you a couple of, of words to think about today. And the rest of it we'll have to, you know, do another time. I was watching the ESPYs. And Jimmy Valvano was on the ESPYs. And you probably don't remember this name, but he was a famous basketball coach from North Carolina State. And he was dying of cancer. And I'm a huge basketball fan and I'm watching this guy's life and I know he's dying. And he wins this award. It's an ESPY. It's like a Grammy for athletes. And he gets up on stage to win this Lifetime Achievement Award. And this is live TV, right? So they say to these people, if you win these awards, uh, listen, you have two minutes to thank your family. You're off, man. We got to go to commercial. So he gets up there and you could tell that something was off. You could tell that this guy's not going to talk for two minutes, right? And, and so, and you can YouTube this. He stands up there and he talks for 11 and a half minutes straight. <laughs> it was awesome. And the whole time ESPN keeps flashing this light. Stop talking, right? Commercial, please stop. And Jimmy Valvano, like a good Italian, where are my Italians in here? Italians will appreciate this. Like a good Italian goes, I have tumors all over my body. Do you think I care about your commercial break? And he goes like this. And I'm like, yes. Sounds like my dad, right? Okay. So what's ESPN going to do? They have to make a choice. Do you go to commercial or do you stick with the dying guy? <laughs> we stick with the dying guy. That's way better TV. And he stands up there and he says, every day, every person should do three things. They should think and they should laugh and they should have their emotions stirred. Think about that. He said, you do that. That's a full life. Well, let's go through his list. I added a few words, but let's go through his. Are you thinkers? Honestly, would you consider yourself a thinker? Because if you are, you should be able to answer the following questions for me. Okay? You should be able to tell me where the Dow Jones Industrial Average closed yesterday within a thousand points. You should. Within a thousand points. You should be able to sit down with me at lunch and we should be able to talk about Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan and the Middle East and China and Medicare and Medicaid and the debt in America. We should be able to talk about politics and science. Listen, not like experts. You're just college students, right? Can you talk like an educated college student who's sitting in a seat? See, here's the thing. You are taking up a seat. One of the favorite things I do in my life is I go talk to inner city schools. I go to high schools in tough cities and I say to these kids, listen, if you could have anything, what would it be? And you know what they say to me a lot is what I wouldn't do for a seat at your school. What I wouldn't do to go here. Well, I can't because my dad's in jail. My mom's addicted to meth. I got my own problems. I'll never sit in the seat at the University of Denver, but what I wouldn't do for one. And here you all sit in a seat. You're here in a seat. My question is, what are you doing with your seat? Are you thinking with your seat? See, the point of college to me in your science classes, I don't care how much chemistry you learn. I think it's irrelevant. I, I want you to learn how to think like a scientist. I don't care about your business classes necessarily. I want you to learn to think analytically like a lawyer, like a business person. Learn how to think strategically like a manager, right? Go into your math class and learn how to use that part of your brain. That's what I care about. Listen, grades should follow knowledge. And what kind of knowledge do you have? What are you gaining? Or are you just taking up a seat? Listen, that's a question you should ask yourself every day. Am I just taking up a seat? Okay, then he said laugh. We'll end with that one. Then he said you should have your emotions stirred. And what Jimmy V meant by that is every day you should get goosebumps. Do you? Women are always like, yeah, I got goosebumps now. Women are good at this. Men go like this. <clears throat> no. Goosebumps? I'm a man. <laughs> I'm going to say something. I want to see if you all agree with me. I believe we're losing our young men in this country. What do you think? I'll prove it to you. Average GPA for a college female is 3.2. Average GPA for a college male is 2.7. 2.7. Now, women, your time's coming, so hold on a second. I went to a Future Business Leaders of America conference. There were 18 executive leadership positions, 17 of which were filled by women. One guy walking around like, what do I do next? You should have seen this guy. Luckiest guy ever, right? I mean, the odds are in your favor, man. My wife says, and I'm from Colorado, we have pot problems. My wife says medical marijuana cards are issued 95% of them to young men 18 to 26 with back pain, <laughs> right? We're losing our young men completely. And unless we turn this around, we're not going to be able to make it. Guys, let me tell you something. I admire a man who's tough, who's physically strong, who's mentally strong. I admire a man who's like that. But that's not mutually exclusive from being able to get goosebumps. <laughs> It's not. Let me tell you this, men. When a man figures out his life, he becomes very emotional. I want everyone in this room to picture a man who's older than you, who you think has life figured out. And I'll make a promise to you. 
That's an emotional man. <laughs> Guys, plug in, please. Women, your turn. <laughs> you still face a glass ceiling. My wife is one of three female surgeons in North Denver. In a city of four million people, there are three female surgeons. Females make less than men. When she walks into the operating room, they look at her and they say, are you the nurse? <laughs> right? These are the kind of things they say to her. But women, let me tell you this, my wife grew up with nothing, broken home, parents didn't really care about her. I mean, honestly, she grew up with nothing and she went to Cornell Medical School. If, if my wife can go to Cornell Medical School, so can you. <laughs> so can you, right? But we have to find a way to get goosebumps every day because when we're getting goosebumps, our minds are focused on important things. Guys, please, and women keep fighting, right? So Jimmy V said laugh. He said we should laugh. And let me add to that, I think we should laugh at ourselves. <laughs> I never used to add that part, but people are getting dumber. And I get emails now and they say, Professor, I heard you two months ago. I've been laughing at other people for months now and it's not helping. <laughs> Why would you think that would help? Actually, the studies show that that makes it worse. I want everyone in this room to understand this. Every American on average farts 14 times a day. I can't believe I'm saying this in a church. <laughs> They gave people $200 to walk around and count and record on a website the number of times they farted each day. And that number was 14 on average. Raise your hand if you would take that money. What's wrong with the rest of you? Get paid. If you're going to fart anyway, get paid. Anyway, the men are always like, yeah, dude, I just farted now. <laughs> yeah. Men love this. Women are horrified by this. The women are like, not me. Yeah, you, you do, 14. No, seriously. She's like, I hate you. Anyway. How dare you sit in this beautiful church and fart and not laugh at my jokes. <laughs> you have to find a way every day to laugh. Please don't take yourself too seriously. Life is hard enough, isn't it? And if we don't find a way to laugh at ourselves, that's why students drop out of college. And that's why adults run into midlife crises. So why does any of this matter? Let me, let me try to conclude and tell you why any of this matters. And I'll give you four reasons. Number one, again, if you want to be happy, if that's your life's goal, it is impossible to be happy unless you are an ethical person. This period. So it's irrational to be unethical in my opinion. Number two, if you just pick one thing that we talked about today, honestly, if you find some better friends, if you work on your character, if you try to find some peace in your life, if you think more, maybe you start to think, maybe you find a way to get goosebumps, maybe you laugh at yourself more, I, mean, I don't know. Pick one of these things for the next three weeks and do it and I promise you, you'll be a happier person. I promise. Number three, George Washington Carver said, no person has any right to come into this world and to leave it without leaving behind him or her legitimate and distinct reasons for having passed through it. Translation, you have no right to be born and to die without leaving behind yourself a legacy. Have you thought about what your legacy will be at this place? Have you asked yourself seriously what you're doing with your seat? The fourth thing is I have a daughter, 11 months old, and when she is 18, you will be in charge of her life. And I don't want my daughter living in a world where 70% of you cheat where you care only about yourselves, where it's pulling teeth to get you to these convocations, where you don't see yourself as part of something bigger than yourself. Honestly, it's all about you. We're selfish. We're ambi Listen, I don't want her living in that world. By the way, raise your hand if you ever want to have kids. Anybody? When your kids are 18, my daughter will be in charge of your kids' lives. You don't want your kids living in a world where my daughter cheats, do you? Or my daughter cares only about herself, do you? Or my daughter is greedy and envious and selfish. Or my daughter doesn't take her education seriously. You don't, listen, you don't want your kids living in that world, do you? And so at the end of the day, Immanuel Kant is a famous philosopher and he says this, if you don't like the way something's going in your world, you have a moral obligation to help fix it. So if you don't like the way something's going on this campus or in your life, you have a moral obligation to help fix it. Let me tell you how to get a hold of me. If you want to find me, just go onto Facebook. And just do a forward slash and type in Prof C, short for professor, P-R-O-F-C. And 8,000 people look at that page every day. Why don't you go on there and say something productive? They don't want to hear from me anymore. They want to hear from you. They want to know what you think about life. Honestly, think about your legacy and I don't care what your legacy is. A young woman came up to me once and she was crying and she said, Corey, all I want to do is be a good mom. She goes, listen, in about 10 years I want to have kids and I want to be a good mom and all these women are telling me that that's not okay and what do you think? And I looked at her and I said, do we need more good moms? And she goes, well, yeah. And I said, cool. By the way, we need more good dads. That's another two-hour talk, so for another day. Then a kid comes up to me and he's in tears, this big, strong man. He looks at me and he goes, my mom has cancer. 
and I'm going to find a cure for cancer. And I looked at that kid, and I said, kid, do we need a cure for cancer? And he goes, yeah. And I said, go. I don't care. I don't care what you pick to do with your life. All I ask is that whatever you choose, you do with character and you do with integrity. And if you do that, we'll all be okay, I think. Thank you for listening.